Hey, this is chapter six. I will be looking at the top of the cell. I'm going to uh, be fast and very detailed uh, about this chapter. Now, when you look at organisms, all organisms that we call living organisms are made up of cells. Um, so that means the cell is the building block of all organisms. And so that's why we say the cell is the functional unit of life. All right. So the cell is a functional or is a structural and functional unit of life, which means that the smallest thing that can be a cell is the smallest thing that can have the characteristic of life is the cell. All right. So we say the cell is a functional and um, is a structural and functional unit of life. All right. So, um, there are different kinds of cells, and we'll be looking at them uh, as we go. Now, these are cells of varying sizes. Um, so we study cells. If you look at all the sizes here, you will see that they are mostly very small. This is 0 0.1 nanometer, 1 nanometer, 10 nanometer. So all of these are very tiny to the high, to, for the high to see. So we look at cells using the microscope. All right, so we say that study of cells using the microscope is called cytology, and the process of microscope is microscopy using microscope. All right, an average human cell is about 100 micrometer, uh, and you see the mitochondria is about one micrometer. All right, so what microscope does for cell as we study? is that for some of you that are working in the lab currently, either you are doing HAPE-1 or you are doing general biology, you see that when you look at the microscope, there is the ocular lens on the microscope where you put your eye and the objective lenses where you put the objects, all right? So what microscope does is to magnify the image for us, uh, for us to be able to see an enlarged image on the microscope. And most time the microscope has, the slide has stained such that you can see different shades on the lens, all right? So when a microscope magnify the lens, magnify an object, uh, that is what we call magnification, all right? So you have the 4 hex, which is the scanner lens, you have the 410 hex, which is the low power, and we have the 40 hex, which is the low power, all right? Now, the resolution of the object talks about the clarity of the object, and you know you use the smooth adjustment knob for some of you that are conversant with microscope to, to make the object clear, to give it clarity, and that is what does with the resolution. Then contrast is your ability to see different parts of the cell. So if you take your cheek cell, for instance, now, for some of you doing the 1106 currently, if you take the cheek cell, which some of you did the experiment, uh, if you put it on the microscope, you are not going to see anything because everything is clear, it's white, it's transparent color, right? So you have to stain it. And so most, I mean, oftentimes, we stain it with metal in blue. So metal, we stain it with metal in blue so that you are able to see different contrast. You can see the nucleus and different portion of the cell for contrast. All right. Now, we have different kinds of microscope. We have the electron microscope and the light microscope. The light microscope uses the principle of light. So it shines light through the image, and then what it gives through the image, uh, it's passed through the image with a beam of light and then reflects. That is what we call a uh, light microscope. So the visible light is passed through a specific image for a, a specimen and then through the glass lens, and it reflects on the other side, which is what we call light. That's the principle of light microscope. Now, light microscope have the capacity to magnify up to 1,000 times the size of the actual image. Um, um, I've talked about staining to enhance the contrast of the image. And then um, most substance uh, organelles are actually small to be resolved by a light microscope. So we usually use an uh, electron microscope to look at tiny objects. So we have electron microscope, which are two types. You have the scanning electron microscope 
and the transmission electron microscope. The scanning just look at the surface of the image. It's not projecting into the image. It's not transmitting into the image. It's just scanning the surface. All right. Um, whereas the transmission is going to transmit electron through the image so that you can see internal structures on the image. So that's the key thing about transmission. You are seeing the internal structures. All right. So if you look at these pictures here, you have this uh, showing you how light microscope is. So if you are looking at your cheek cell now and you don't have any stain on the cheek cell, you are going to be seeing an image like this. It's just going to be a transparent image like that. Now, if you decide to stain it, it comes out like this. So these, these have um, better trans, uh, contrast, right? So you see face contrast, you see differential intra, uh, interface, interference, contrast there. Um, so this is fluorescence. And um, okay, so look at this now. This is electron microscope showing you the electrons, showing you the image, just the three dimensional image, not showing you anything inside. And this is transmission showing you the details of the cell. You see the cross section of cilia, it's showing you the lateral section, showing you the inside, it's cutting inside, transmitting. All right. Um, I'll just keep this stuff actually. No. Now, there are two different kinds of cells. Predominantly, we have the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. Now, prokaryotic cell are cells in code that were discovered before the nucleus was discovered. Okay. So we call them prokaryotic, meaning that before carrion. And carrion is used for the nucleus, so before the nucleus, so prokaryotic. And eukaryotic means true nucleus, all right? So prokaryotics, in quotes, they don't have the nucleus, whereas eukaryotic cells have the true nucleus. Now, you want to ask me, can any, if they don't have the nucleus, then how do they exist? They have DNA. Now, cells are not required to have nucleus, but every cell must have a DNA. The DNA is the identity of the cell. So if the cell does not have DNA, then the cell cannot exist, all right? So every cell must have DNA, but not all cells necessarily need to have a nucleus, all right? So the basic structure and functional unit of every organism is, is called a cell, and it could be prokaryotic cell or eukaryotic cell. Now, organisms are generally divided into three domains, and I use this as a way of just joking, never to forget it. I say that domain is B. Now, what does B mean? B A means bacteria. B is bacteria. A is archaea. And um, E is eukarya. So I say domain is B, those three words there. Now, bacteria and archaea are actually prokaryotic organism. And in eukarya are actually eukaryotic organism. So, um, you belong to the eukarya, I belong to the eukarya. It's a domain. It does the same domain where the kingdom plants belong to, the kingdom animalia belong to, the kingdom fungi belong to. Those are eukaryotic organism that have true nucleus, all right? So proteins, fungi, animals, and plants all consist of the eukaryotic organism, whereas bacteria and archaea belong to the um, prokaryotic. All right, now, every cell have these components common to them. Every cell have the plasma membrane, which is also the same as a uh, cell membrane, is the same thing as phospholipid bilayer, bilayer. Plasma membrane, cell membrane, phospholipid bilayer is the same. Uh, every cell has a cytoplasm, and inside the cytoplasm, you have the cytosol, which is a liquid component, all right? It's a liquid component that holds organelles in place. So this is a liquid, a fluid. We call it semi-fluid, and it's located inside the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is 
spells. So it's located inside. inside the cytoplasm all right now then we have chromosomes which carry genes genetic information and ribosome which makes protein so every cell however small must have these features so prokaryotic cells have those features and eukaryotic cell does so what is key thing prokaryotic cells don't have they lack nucleus like we said but eukaryotic cell have the true nucleus now, instead of having a nucleus, these guys, we say they have nucleoid region. I'm going to write that here. So they have nucleoid region. They don't have nucleus, but they have nucleoid region. Now, the nuclear region is simply the region where the chromosomes are located. All right. Now, number two, we say that they lack various internal structures bound with phospholipid membranes. So, like now, an example of that is to say that they don't have the nucleus, and the nucleus have its own double membrane as well. Uh, they don't have um, Golgi apparatus. They don't have endoplasmic reticulum, and those organs have those organelles have their own membranes. So, prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles, whereas eukaryotic have a lot of them. Prokaryotic cells are usually smaller, so you see them, they're usually about approximately one, uh, one micrometer. They are usually that small. Uh, the largest of them you see will be around like a little few micrometer, like five micrometer, that's the largest you will see. But prokaryotic cell, uh, eukaryotic cell range from 10 to 100 micrometer. All right. Then um, they have simple structure. Prokaryotic cells are simple. Eukaryotic cells are more complex. Prokaryotic cell belong, I mean, include the domain eukarya and, uh, I mean, domain prokary, uh, domain bacteria and archaea, whereas eukaryotic cell include the domain eukarya, which are the algae, the protozoans, fungi, animals, and plants. All right? Those are eukaryotic and prokaryotic cell differences. Now, another thing that is not on this slide is that prokaryotic cell have circular it, it has a single circular dna whereas eukaryotic cell have multiple linear dna all right prokaryotic cell are usually unicellular whereas eukaryotic cell are mostly multicellular or eukaryotes are mostly multicellular all right so this is a view of what prokaryotic cell looks like you can see this is what i call the nucleoid region you see that there nucleoid that is where the nucleus, I mean, that's where the chromosome is. Now, if you look at this, this may look like many strands, but it's just one strand. So one strand of chromosome, it has one beginning and one end. It's just coiled on each other. So we call it, we say that it is one circular DNA. I mean, one circular chromosome. It's circular coiled on each other. All right. Then uh, on the plasma membrane is selective. We call we say it is semi permeable. It does not allow everything to pass through it. It allows things to pass through it, but not everything can pass through the cell membrane, and not everything can um, come out of it or in out of it. So it's selective. So it's semi permeable. All right. So we say the cell membrane is semi-permeable. I'm going to write that here. So we say the cell membrane is semi or semi-permeable. Now, the plasma membrane is selectively, it's a selective membrane that allows passage of oxygen. So oxygen can pass through the membrane, like nutrients, some nutrients can pass through, some waste are able to pass through um, the cell. So the general structure of the plasma membrane is usually double layer. Like you can see here, there is going to be the phosphate edge, which is hydrophilic, meaning that it loves water, and the fatty acid tail, which is hydrophobic, meaning that they hate water. All right, so every cell membrane is made up of the phosphate edge and the fatty acid tail, two of them. All right, so I'll type that here. So every cell membrane is made up of the 
the phosphate head and uh, two fatty acid tail. The phosphate head is hydrophilic because it loves water. We say it loves water, so it's hydrophilic. So the phosphate head is hydrophilic and the fatty acid tail is hydrophobic. Now, um, yeah, we just maybe. Now, an eukaryotic cell, so this should be an eukaryotic cell has internal membrane, like we said, and that divides the cell into compartments, which is what we call organelles. So there are different compartments, different membranes in an eukaryotic cell. Um, the plasma membrane and organelles participate directly in the cell metabolism, and I'll be talking about all of that as we go. So when you look at the eukaryotic cell, this is what you see. Uh, looking at the eukaryotic cell, you can see that you have the nucleus, which is why we call it a true nucleus cell, eukaryotic. Now, you have the nucleus, you have the endoplasmic reticulum, and this here is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We call it smooth endoplasmic reticulum because it doesn't have ribosome on its cell membrane. And then you have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum here. Okay, over here you have the Golgi apparatus. You have ribosomes stored on the membranes. You have the mitochondria over here. You have lysosome here. You have perizosome here, uh, which are all membrane band organelles and they are responsible for metabolic activity of the cell. Okay, I'll be talking about each of them as we study. Now, the here is. Looking at this, you see an animal cell. Looking at this, you see a plant cell. What is key about plant cell? There are three major things that you should not forget about plant cell. The first thing is this central vacuole here, where, which is what they use to store water. This is why plant cell don't undergo hemolysis because they store water, they have capacity to store, store water, whereas your red blood cell does not have capacity to store water. Then here you have a cell wall, all right? So now you will notice that this cell have a cell membrane, uh, a cell membrane first, which is what you see here, plasma membrane. Now you see the plasma membrane of this cell this way, right? Now additional membrane is the cell wall. Now the cell wall is actually made up of cellulose is a polysaccharide which is very strong and difficult to digest and that is why the cell membrane is tough all right so the tough thing that you always see in plants that you not see in animal is the chloroplast the chloroplast is what contains thylakoid which are each of those tags and it contains chlorophyll that makes, that attracts sunlight, which is the reason that plant is able to undergo photosynthesis that you cannot undergo photosynthesis. So the main thing is that there's a chlorophyll inside the chloroplast, I mean chlorophyll inside the thylakoid, which is what makes up the chloroplast, all right? So when you see this, you see the hedges, the cellulose give you that shape because of the cell wall, all right? Now, um, here are different cells. You have human cells here uh, from the uterus, and um, you have uh, yeast cells here. You have a uh, chlamydomonas here. And uh, those cells are right there. Now let's go ahead and look at each of those features that are present in each of the cell. Now the nucleus is what contains the DNA. I told you, Every cell contains DNA. The only thing is that in prokaryotic cell, the nucleus houses the DNA. The DNA has a nuclear envelope, which is why we call it nucleus. All right. So the nucleus contains most of the DNA in this eukaryotic cell. And um, what happens is so you have DNA. And uh, what we we'll say is that information flows 
Uh, this is central dogma of biology. I'll just write it with my mouse here. Um, so information flows from DNA flows to mRNA. Flows to protein. All right, that's how information flows. So now it means that the information that is piled up in this DNA will be converted to mRNA, then to protein. So the guy that does this conversion from mRNA to protein is the ribosome. So ribosome is the guy that does this stage. I will call this stage translation. This stage is called transcription. All right. So this stage is called transcription. And this stage is called translation. Let's go. Now, the nucleus itself contain most of the cell's DNA gene, and it's actually, you see it at the center of every cell. Then it has an envelope. The envelope protects the nucleus, separated from the cytoplasm. And um, like I said, the nucleus itself has a double membrane, and each membrane also consists of a bilayer, a lipid bilayer. So it's more like the same orientation with the cell membrane itself. On the nuclear membrane, you are going to see some holes, which we call pores, all right? Those pores, we call it pores, and the pores allow movement of molecules in and out of the cell. So when the mRNA is secreted now, the DNA is going to make mRNA inside the nucleus, and after it's made, then the mRNA needs to go out of the nucleus because ribosome is not inside the nucleus. So mRNA goes out of the nucleus so that it can make, it can be used to make protein by the ribosome. So it goes through the nuclear pulse. All right. Now the shape of the nucleus is maintained by the nuclear nabina, which is composed of protein. Um, that that um, the there is a protein. This a picture of the protein showing you how the protein makes help to maintain or stabilize the structure of the nucleus all right now inside the nucleus i told you you have chromosomes in prokaryotic cell we have one circular dna or one circular chromosome inside the nuclear region or at the nuclear region but in eukaryotic cell we have many linear Mod millions of linear chromosomes are located inside eukaryotic nucleus. All right. Uh, for each chromosome, it is that what we call chromosome actually is DNA plus protein. And the name of the protein is called histone protein. Histone protein. So the name of this protein is called histone. So DNA. And histone protein makes chromosome. Now listen, when chromosome is visible, we call it chromosome. When it is not visible, when it is scattered, we call it chromatin. Chromatin, think about it as chromatiny. All right, so we say that chromatin we condense to form discrete chromosomes as cell prepares to divide. The purpose of chromosome forming is when the cell is ready to divide and it will be difficult for the cell to, let me see if I can make dots with it. Now, if you have a lot of all of these dots, it will be difficult for the cell to divide this into two different cells. Now, it is easy to divide a strand like this than to divide uh, granules like this. So the way I differentiate between chromosome and chromatin is this. Let's say I'm currently in a room, and if you look at the room where you are as well now, currently the room may look neat. Now the room I'm here, I'm in here is neat. But if we bring a vacuum here and vacuum this room, are we going to likely get that? Yes. 
there's almost it's almost impossible that we we'll vacuum the room and won't see dirt in the in the vacuum. What has happened now? When the when you have not vacuumed it, the dirt look invisible. That is chromatin. But when you vacuum it, with, when you use a vacuum, the vacuum will condense the dirt together. And then you are going to see it and you're going to say, oh, the dirt are visible. That is chromosome. Now, is there a difference between the composition of these dirt and when it, vac when it vacuum? No. The difference is that one is scattered and because it's scattered, it's invisible. Then one is compact, condensed, and then it becomes visible. All right, so chromatin condensed to form discrete chromosome. Now, the nucleus is located within the nucleus, and that is actually what is the basis for formation of ribosomal RNA, which will later form the ribosome that makes protein as well. Now, here is ribosome. The main job that this guy does is to make protein. So anywhere you see ribosome, the job it does is to make protein. And um, so you see it carry out protein synthesis, which I call translation. Now, there are two locations where you see ribosome or two categories that we put it. There are some ribosomes that are located freely. They just they are just scattered in the cell. And if you look at it, uh, I'll talk about I'll show it to you now. So some ribosomes are just scattered in the cell. If you look at these now, over here you are going to see ribosome here. Now you will notice that there are some purple dots here. We call these, these are ribosomes here. Ribosomes are all over here. You see ribosomes all over here. Now, all of the ribosomes that are free, that are inside the cytoplasm, that are not attached to anything, we call it free ribosomes. So ribosomes that are not attached to anything are called free ribosomes. But you can see there are some ribosomes here. On the nuclear envelope, you have some ribosomes there. On the endoplasmic reticulum, you have some ribosomes there. Those ribosomes that are located in surfaces, we call it, we call it um, band ribosomes. So if you look at these now, so if you look at these, you see that um, some ribosomes are called free ribosomes. Those free ribosomes mean that they are in the, in the cytoplasm. Then we have some ribosomes that are called band ribosomes, and we call them because we are called them band because they are located in the nucle on the membrane they are bound to a surface they are not free they are bound to a surface so we call them band ribosomes all right so ribosomes that are free free ribosomes they are not bound to any surface ribosomes that are bound we call them band or so the ribosome key thing about the differences in the ribosome is that the ribosomes that are inside the that are inside the cytoplasm which we call free ribosome makes protein that are needed for that cell whereas some ribosomes that are on the endoplasmic reticulum are able to make ribosomes that could help other cells to meet their need as well to make protein that could help other cells to meet their protein need as well now we have what we call the endomembrane system the endomembrane system is simply a system of transportation, and it includes the nuclear envelope, not the nucleus. It includes the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosome, vacuoles, plasma membrane. I, I will talk about each of that as it works. So look at this. So when you, when the proteins, let's say protein now, for instance, are made from the end, from the by the ribosome on the nuclear envelope, those protein or the endoplasmic reticulum, those protein will be packaged into vesicle. Then it will travel to the Golgi apparatus. When it comes to the Golgi apparatus, it's going to pass through the Golgi apparatus for further processing and modification and for packaging. So it will package again into vesicle, and the vesicle will then emerge or merge up with the plasma membrane, then get out of there. Now. Those all the components that I just mentioned now, the nuclear envelope, endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough, Golgi apparatus, vesicle, nuclear envelope, those are part of the endomembrane system. They are membrane, they are system of transportation. And if you reverse it, reverse it as well, and you're thinking of something coming into the cell, which we call endocytosis. Now, how if a substance has come into the cell with a vesicle, how will the cell have access to those substances? 
The only way the cell will have access to those substances is when the lysosome comes in and break those break the membrane, the vacuole, the membrane covering the substance. And then when the membrane is broken, the cell can then have access to those substances. So that's why we call that's why this lysosome is also part of the endomembrane system. So the membrane system is simply a system of transportation that helps to maintain, I mean, to transport resources into or out of the cell, all right? Endoplasmic reticulum, I told you already, there are two, endoplasmic reticulum is one, but there's a portion of endoplasmic reticulum that have ribosomes on it. If it has ribosome on it, then it's called rough endoplasmic reticulum. If it does not have ribosome on it, then it's smooth. All right. Now the endoplasmic reticulum also comes with membrane, double membranes. All right. Now, it, so the one that makes the one that is smooth makes lipid. It also makes smooth substance. All right. It helps with metabolic zim. It helps to detoxify the body, and it helps to store calcium. The one that is rough, because it's rough, and rough means that it has ribosome on it. It makes protein. All right, so it has band ribosomes on it, which helps to secrete glycoprotein, uh, meaning that protein is bonded with carbohydrates. It helps with transportation, just to what I just told you. Then it makes some proteins that are surrounded by membrane. All right. Go get apparatus. The major job it does, you see, is to modify the product from the endoplasmic reticulum, either the lipid from the smooth or the protein from the uh, rough. All right, so it manufactures certain protein and macromolecules. It helps to sort them, to package them into vesicle for transportation. And that's why you can see that. So the Goge apparatus have the C side, which we call receiving side, and the trans side, which is the shipping or the transportation side. Now, lysosome, major thing about lysosome is that it contains digestive enzymes. And the digestive enzymes help to break down molecules. It helps to break down substances that are due for recycling in the body. It helps to do all of that. Now, um, I will, so I'll stop here and I'll be talking about, I'll start this on the next video. Thank you.